And without further ado, I would like to welcome you all and open our conversation for the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Shady, for that introduction and to Lost City Books for hosting what is my first um, and possibly last in-person <laughs> book talk for Allies and Rivals. And a special thank you uh, to my friends and colleagues, Cynthia and Michael, uh, for joining in the conversation and, um, and, my, and my new friends who um, have um, come out this e rainy evening uh, to join us for this talk. And so I came into DC last night and I spent the morning at the Library of Congress where I have done research for this book and which is oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> has a kind of cameo um, in the book when uh, Thomas Jefferson asks an American sojourner, George Tickner, um, who's en route to Germany in 1816 to buy him books to furnish a new, a major American library. And as I trek back in the rain, I was just thinking about how hard it is to imagine the time before monumental institutions like the Library of Congress, um, um, before they existed, so ingrained um, as they are in our public imagination. Because old age can obscure complicated and more volatile origin stories. And the same, I think, goes for higher ed. Critics like to paraphrase uh, Clark Kerr, who was this legendary post-World War II uh, University of California president, um, who was fond of saying that there are only two institutions that still exist that are as old as the university. And they are the British Parliament and the Catholic Church. And you, when people quote this, they don't mean it as a compliment. <laughs> because old age is proof um, that the university is hidebound and difficult, even impossible to change. But I'm here to tell you this evening, or at least persuade you, <laughs> that a historically informed uh, view shows that universities have survived not because they've stayed the same, but because they've proved, proven to be remarkably adaptable. Now, when I talk about the university, I mean, as a design innovation, um, the modern university is an institution that unites the advancement of knowledge through research and the dissemination of knowledge through teaching. And its inception in Germany in the first decade of the 19th century inspired an American adaptation that merged the German version with the English undergraduate college to produce a new bundle uh, that would be emulated the world over. But it was never preordained that American higher education would end up this way. And in fact, almost as soon as it's founded, we get here simultaneous cries that this institution is so entrenched and therefore impossible to change and also totally inadequate, right? <laughs> Insufficient and inefficient. And I think that's a contradiction that, that persists uh, in the conversation to this day. So the narrative in Allies and Rivals excavates the origins of this institution as well as other related concepts of the university like meritocracy and academic freedom that often go unquestioned. And to do this, we travel back to Berlin in 1806, where Napoleon has just crushed the Prussians, captured the city, and in an effort to consolidate his power, he shut down over 22 um, or over half of the universities in the German lands. And the next year, in response to protests from unemployed uh, professors, <laughs> the Kaiser Friedrich Wilhelm III reputedly declared the state must replace uh, through intellectual powers, what it has lost in, uh, in the way of physical ones. And answering this call was Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, the greatest synthesizer, organizer, and if I may be so crude, a marketer of the research university. Of course, my uh, German scholars might know Wilhelm as a linguist by training, an aristocratic diplomat by trade, um, and the elder brother of course, of the celebrated scientist Alexander. And in the first decade of the 19th century, Wilhelm was help, happily married to a woman uh, by the name of Carolyn Decker Rudin. He was writing letters, he was collecting art, and generally enjoying presiding over salon life. And I'll read a short excerpt from this moment um, when he gets this call. And so when Humboldt learned in 1808, while stationed in Rome as ambassador to the Holy See, that he had been chosen for the very public task of remaking the Prussian education system, his first reaction was hesitation. Quote, on the few occasions when people still approach me, I only give in when I can be sure that I will make a genuine contribution, he wrote to his wife. 
for such an ambitious project would certainly ruin his ruah or peace, which would be horrific to have tasted once and then lost forever. And besides, he said, how much can you really accomplish in Prussia today with such limited resources? Managing a crowd of scholars, he complained to Lee, which was the pet name for his wife, was not much better than running a traveling circus. His sigh of resignation is almost audible 200 years later. Uh, but despite his initial reluctance, Humboldt became, we might say, the or academic innovator. And with Humboldt at the helm over the next three years, the University of Berlin was established as an institution that reflected the aspirations of this post-war state. It would train professionals, civil service servants, and it would improve the military through that training, right? So they wouldn't lose any more wars to any more Napoleons. And it would produce and it would authenticate knowledge. And in a series of letters and documents, Humboldt lays out the relationship of this new institution to society, um, in which scholars receive patronage and a great deal of autonomy um, to pursue research, enjoy academic freedom, among other things, in exchange for providing services to that wider society, including usually teaching, but sometimes training of other kinds. The scholars tend to refer to this arrangement as the humble ideal. But in my telling, in fact, it's, it's in fact much more transactional. And it's this exchange that I like to call the academic social contract. And in my story, it's what distinguishes uh, the University of Berlin in this particular moment from its antecedents. And it marks the beginning of the modern university. The world quickly took note the University of Berlin was the envy of everyone, it seems. The British, the Japanese, the Russians, right? It, it's, it's very quickly seen as the central component, the sine qua non even, of a self-respecting modern state. And there were soon universities established all over Europe, one in Oslo in 1811, Warsaw in 1816, and Athens in 1837. The U.S. admittedly was late to the game, but soon the American students start arriving and they come in, in a little bit at first and then in droves. And over the course of the 19th century, century in particular toward the end of that century, nearly 10,000 Americans have visited German universities. A young African-American sociologist by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois uh, was among them as well as a resourceful female student, Martha Carey Thomas, intent on finding a German uh, professor to support her ambitions to become the founding president of Bryn Mawr. When historians write about the relationship between Germany and America, they tend to refer to the import or the influence of the German university. But I would argue that universities aren't commodities that are important, imported, and influence, I think, suggests a unilateralism that doesn't reflect the dynamism of this relationship. And, and in my analysis, it's the bi-directional, um, so two-way transatlantic exchange that spins the motor of intellectual, institutional, and political history. The Americans took what they learned and they adapted it to iterate on those institutions. And in that era, nearly 45 U.S. university presidents were alumni of the universities of Göttingen and Leipzig alone. One such visitor, Daniel Coit Gilman, funded by a railroad magnet in nearby Baltimore, would combine the antebellum American college that offered the BA uh, to undergraduates with the German style research institutions that trained graduates and offered the PhD. And that version, version, of course, the Johns Hopkins University became the first modern research university in America in 1876. And it inspired early adopters at home, including in Chicago and Palo Alto, as well as fear abroad. Because by 1900, the Prussian reformers were now citing the declining number of American students at German universities as a potential threat to what they called their worldwide reputation of German academic research. And they were starting to send Germans to learn from the American version of the German university. 
So Germans like the mathematician Felix Klein or the cultural historian uh, Karl Lamprecht may have arrived in America skeptical of these American Arivist institutions, but they left interested in American campus architecture, the private financing of scholarship, and co-education, to name a few innovations that they were eager to use to give their institutions a leg up back home. So a pattern emerges over the course of the narrative. Academic entrepreneurs contracted with their communities and polities, exchanging service to society in return for patronage and institutional autonomy. And these contracts evolved over time as the needs of societies changed and the aspirations of academic leaders uh, grew. So once one academic social contract was exhausted, academic entrepreneurs rush in and found, find new partners. They formulate new ideas and they establish new institutions, sometimes even outside the university. So Allies and Rivals really contains two stories then. It, it tells the story of the ascent of Germany and America and their ambitions for world power at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And it also contains more universal lessons about how ideas spread and where innovation comes from, um, namely through the open exchange of ideas um, and competitive emulation, even and perhaps especially with institutional rivals. And, and perhaps that's an important reminder in our moment of resurgent nationalism. We might even say that the pandemic has created a kind of shock to the education system um, that in many ways feels comparable to the wars that often prompted the change over the hundred year story that I tell. And we don't yet know, I think a lot of people are saying whether the institution that combined research and teaching will survive um, intact. But I will try to persuade you this evening that allies and rivals argue, argues that we must understand uh, the history of the university in order to envision um, its future. And, and hopefully we can do a little bit of that in our, in our conversation this evening. Thank you. So I want to also kind of open it up and broaden to ask each of you, Cynthia and, and Michael, what are your you've both had the opportunity to read the book and to sort of relate it to your own area of expertise. What are some connections that you've made um, just at your first or second, however many read of, of this book? Well, I'm a sociologist, not a historian. So I think I have to preface what I say by saying I'm, I mostly think about the present and or the very recent past. Um, and so a lot of what I, the way I read through the book was thinking about, uh, especially my first read through the book was thinking about the implications, you know, constantly thinking about these implications about this, the university as a bridge between state and society for what that, what that means right now. Um, and also thinking about, you know, so that's one, you know, what, what's, where are we right now in terms of a lot of the themes that come out in the book around um, the, the strange ways that Germany became kind of a, a place where women could go and study, white women, you know, could go and study from the U.S. Um, when they didn't have those opportunities here? How does that work? Does that same thing happen now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, having also worked and studied in Germany for a long time, knowing that I never would have been able to become a professor there because of the gendered way that mm -hmm. hierarchies work within the German university system right now. It's much, much harder in Germany to become uh, to become a professor as a woman. They've tried to change that, but most of the women have left the university system and work within the, mm -hmm. the private um, research institutes mm -hmm. instead, as we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And I would say probably a lot of the, um, not just women, but racial and ethnic minorities as well. Mm -hmm. So the university is plagued by this kind of like the patronage stuff that you talked mm -hmm. about kind of carried on in the old boys network that promote mm -hmm. um, in the German system. Anyway, it, they're trying to change that with quotas and professorships. Mm -hmm. So like, how does that history of that, that social contract and the way that that um, autonomy, you trade that, you know, I really like that part of your remarks about the, that this, 
that academic entrepreneurs kind of made this deal mm -hmm. um, to get a secure position in return for whatever crumbs they would give to mm -hmm. society and became this bridge between, um, between kind of state and society. But I also think that that was only a bridge that ever worked for certain people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wonder if um, like certain people, men, white men, you know, and probably pretty privileged men got access to that social contract and how does that pan out now in a society that's really trying to confront its own history and what role does the university mm -hmm. play in it so I guess some of those questions are bubbling around in my mind and then um I also we talked about this a little bit at dinner so um you know so you know I'm interested in it but I think the U.S. university as we talked about, is this blend of the German research university mm -hmm. and the British model of the residential college in a way that like so much of what happens at the U.S. university is about cultivation, mm -hmm. not actually about teaching and not about research, mm -hmm. but about something else, which is like, you know, um, kids becoming adults and, mm -hmm. you know, the transition to adulthood, yeah. and especially elite universities, like exploring and, you know, embracing cosmopolitanism and becoming you know, like there's this whole um, way in which the university is marketed to parents, to students as a place for mm -hmm. to become, you know, who you're going to be or whatever, which is not really about teaching, but it's about that whole residential mm -hmm. experience, the study abroad and the sports and all that stuff mm -hmm. that universities don't really have in Germany, mm -hmm. right? You don't have dormitories on campus. You don't have um, clubs in the same way, really. You don't certainly don't have sports teams. You never have like a rock climbing wall or a lazy river there. Right? Yeah. Like, you just can't imagine it because you're also not paying for tuition. So they're not in the mm -hmm. same way. Right. So you don't even have the same kind of merchandise. Right. You have some mm -hmm. of it, but not that much. So the, the mm -hmm. whole um, the marketing of the university as a place to come and like explore and grow mm -hmm. and whatever is a whole different type of social contract mm -hmm. between elite parents, I think, especially and selling a kind of version of transition yeah. to adulthood. So those are the things that were running through my mind. And it's a lot, right? To I know there, there are more questions here on my list, but um, but that's those are, that's my first kind of like contemporary read through is like, what does it mean for stratification and patterns of inequality to inherit that legacy of patronage? Um, is that do you still see those same same patterns? And also how do you how do you really get into that um, issue of the purpose of a university when you're factoring in the high cost of tuition and the way that it's marketed as cultivation and not actually about research or teaching at all. Not about credentials, not about knowledge per se, but about producing a certain kind of adult. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Those are excellent, excellent questions. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about um, sort of the sort of historical outsiders, we might mm -hmm. call them. Um, you mentioned women and, you know, I mentioned W. Boys as well as for a more well-known name perhaps than Martha Martha Carey Thomas who was feminist um, um, a female uh, a student who who also went to, to Germany um, in, in the early 1880s and Du Bois would go in the 1890s and and sort of one of one of the reasons why I am, am really interested in you know I, I, sort of the origin stories of institutions as I was alluding to earlier is because before institutions become ingrained before they kind of take on this sort of seem like they have a life of their own like they're self-evident right mm -hmm. like they've always been there which is clearly this kind of image that the university projects as do many mm -hmm. institutions as I said in this in this town um, before that happens before those those borders are are solidified and the boundaries are rigid um, there's a kind of wild wild west sort of story in which um, you know anybody can have access to these goods and so the fascinating thing is that the in the last quarter of the 19th century, yes, most of the people who go to Germany to pursue uh, the PhD are white, they are male, they are Protestant for the most part, and sort of from the middle and upper class. And the PhD is sort of the stepping stone to the, the, the sort of culmination of their finishing school, right? But... Um, um, but also people who went, who weren't white or, or male or Protestant. And those people thought, well, if I can get this credential, the PhD, then this sort of old boys network that you're alluding to is going to have to take me seriously. Mm -hmm. And so women figure out sort of in the 
18, early 1880s, they start figuring out that there's this sort of loophole in the German system, um, which is that women can be auditors or gastro at the universities. Um, and that actually, if, you, if they could find a professor who was kind of sympathetic, they could kind of um, contract with that professor in a sense and sort of get a PhD almost on an ad hoc basis. And so clusters of women start to appear in places that have the reputation mm -hmm. for this, these kinds of professors. So in Leipzig um, for a while, this is very much the case. And Zurich was known as the most kind of open-minded. So oftentimes women would end up there to get their PhD if they couldn't get it at Heidelberg mm -hmm. or Le Leipzig. And then they would come back and they're sort of, if you read like the articles in the nation and the 1880s, like women are giving advice to other women about how, you know, you know you're not going to be able to, to, to do this at Johns Hopkins, for example, where Martha Carey Thomas was shut out of lectures. She had to have like her boyfriend take lecture notes for her. And she was much too ambitious and proud to set that as her sort of fate, which is part of why she goes kind of to Germany. And so, and soon a sort of funding network emerges and women are sponsoring women, especially, you know, some other maybe, um, um, a women with less means, some Jewish women, you know, some other women even on further on the margins to promote their going. Um, and they're also then trying to use the fact that Germany is giving the PhD to these women to turn around and start pressuring the American institutions to open up. So a kind of competitive sort of emulation game is applied almost to sort of access and not just to excellence, we mm -hmm. might say. Um, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois has a has a sort of, you know, arguably a harder time. I'm some, in some ways easier, in some ways harder. He he goes to Berlin, right? He's 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 in Berlin. He, you know, he studies with important members of the German historical school. Um, he's funded by white philanthropists um, who are who are interested in, in, in helping to fund African-American education after um, the Civil War. But they, what they have in mind is more a vocational training than this sort of more lofty Ph.D. program. And he's beholden to the white philanthropists for the money to finish the semesters that he needs to get the degree. And after he famously basically is denied his funding for his last semester. If he can't get his Ph.D. in Germany, he returns and is his consolation prize. He gets the Ph.D. at Harvard. Okay. Right. And the point about Thomas and Du Bois, I think, is like they're not totally excluded, but they're not totally included either. Right. Both of them would want to be total insiders. Du Bois probably would have, would have wanted to work at sort of a white institution rather than sort of an HBCU or historically black institution. But he never does in his whole career. And he's kind of shunned by the sociology by the school, at, you know, in Chicago, for example, and he goes to Atlanta to create his own parallel seminar. So, and, you know, the same with Thomas, right? She probably would have rather helped to um, make the best institutions in the country co-ed, which was still kind of far from the norm, but instead she takes over Bryn Mawr and tries to create this like really interesting hybrid institution, which is not a liberal arts college, it gives the PhD. It's supposed to be kind of also Hopkins for women. Um, and so they end up innovating, you can say, on the margins. Um, and their sort of marginalization produces new hybrid institutions that then contribute to sort of the sort of heterogeneity of this system, which is increasingly sort of robust and competitive. Um, so I'd like to point to those stories because I do think that outsiders have been historically the source of innovation. Mm -hmm. And there were academic entrepreneurs who, who began to realize this um, and began to tap outsiders at different moments in history also to uh, make their institutions more competitive as Daniel Coit Gilman did um, uh, with Jews and, and making a Jew the head of his math department, a, 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 a James Sylvester, a mathematician who couldn't get a job at, at Cambridge or Oxford, even though he was the best mathematician. So he brought him over to his new fledgling institution and helped seed, you know, the best math department there. So it kind of went both ways and that sort of outsiders were both innovating on the margins and they were also the source of kind of um, uh, sort of competitive edge for um, academic entrepreneurs who are willing to take a chance on them. And, you know, I think I think it's certainly a relevant um, observation today and, and perhaps would be an interesting way to think about sort of diversity um, mm -hmm. differently. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's so nice to see the book. Uh, in print, having seen it before in, in, in other forms, uh, it's a very beautiful book, and of course, it's a it's a wonderful book, and it's 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 nice to see 
doing whatever mysterious things books do in the in the real world <laughs> uh, and interacting with audiences. So it's just a delight to be here this evening and to, to, to have this conversation. I want to just, you know, as one often says, between a question and a comment to, to, to develop a, uh, uh, this point between a question and a comment that goes along two different tracks that really proceed from the title of the book, Allies and Rivals. So I think what's extraordinary about the book is it shows this remarkable contradiction in the universities of this period, but I think it's a contradiction that remains after this period and is still in effect today, which is on the one hand, universities are these utopian places of genuine cosmopolitanism. You know, the British Parliament, mm -hmm. the Catholic Church, and the right. Catholic Church is so <laughs> cosmopolitan more so than the British Parliament, but if you have the university as this institution, uh, it's by its nature one of the most cosmopolitan institutions. Uh, and that fits within, I think, a broader story that you tell beautifully in the book of the United States becoming a superpower in the 1890s, mm -hmm. uh, entering into the world in so many ways. Transportation technology is changing. It's possible to sort of go out uh, and go to Europe, go to Asia, go to different places. Uh, and you do see this remarkable opening up uh, in the United States. And one data point in that opening up is the receptivity to the German university. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Americans are able to import something that mm -hmm. was really worth importing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in turn becomes the sort of conduit for bringing in mm -hmm. new ideas and new conversations, new populations, mm -hmm. new student bodies, uh, all of that. Uh, and of course, the First World War is a interruption of that because that's a phase of conflict and, uh, and uh, an acute nationalism. But then you have the 1920s, which you know, in textbooks used to be taught as the period of isolationism when the United States turns its back on the world. But historians, yourself included, have recently shown us that in fact, the 1920s is another period of opening up, mm -hmm. uh, of bringing in new ideas, of, of really a, a sort of early wave of, uh, of globalization. Uh, and on the American side of the story, the final aspect of that, it's ironic in a way that uh, one you know, can turn to in a moment, but in 1933, mm -hmm. as Germany goes in this terribly different direction, as Hitler comes to power and much of what one knows is, of, 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 as Germany begins to collapse, the United States is the great cosmopolitan beneficiary of all these great scholars, many of them Jewish, and uh, they further open up the American mind or the American imagination, however you wanna, uh, you wanna put it. And also the same story of cosmopolitan can be told about Germany in this year, it's 1871, it becomes a, a proper country, uh, cities really begin to develop new ideas, new technologies, mm -hmm. uh, a new sense of Europe, I think that's there before the First World War. Uh, much less so after the First World War, but this Germany that's the outward looking cosmopolitan Germany that many of us have come to know in our own lives through mm -hmm. travel and spending time there in the last 20 or 30 years. And that of course comes to an end in 1933. So that's maybe the allied part mm -hmm. of it, the allied cosmopolitanism, but then the rival part of it is no less interesting. So universities as vehicles, not just of the nation state, which they are in both cases, Germany and the United States, but they're also vehicles of empire mm -hmm. because the United mm -hmm. States formally becomes an empire argue about it now is the U.S. an empire or not, but you can't argue about it in the 19-teens because after the spanish American War, the U.S. acquires Philippines, the Philippines as a colony, and so the U.S. is an empire. I think it would be a mistake to say that universities are peripheral to that story uh, of empire building and of a very vigorous, aggressive foreign policy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's driven often by technology and knowledge mm -hmm. and many of the things that uh, that universities provide. So one of the incentives, as you argue in the book, to get universities, as you see Britain, Japan uh, and the United States looked at Germany and say, my God, that's great. These universities are great. Not because they're necessarily places of teaching and knowledge production, yeah. because they're places of power production. Uh, and so that's crucial, of course, on the, uh, on the US side. And I think Germany probably goes faster further uh, in this period in that direction. Uh, you know, Weimar Republic, maybe we romanticize a little bit as the sort of the world of cabaret mm -hmm. and, uh, and we focus too much on Bohemian uh, Berlin, but Weimar Republic had its own drive for uh, for power. Certainly, Germany before 1914 was very much defined by empire uh, and power, sort of Bismarck and post Bismarck uh, Germany. And then I, it comes to mind Max Weinreich's book about German professors uh, in the 1920s and how many German students signed on to the National Socialist Movement. So mm -hmm. it's a rupture in 1933, but it's also something that Hitler mm -hmm. was able to capitalize was this lust for power that was there in the universities. Uh, themselves. So I'm just fascinated by the way your book upholds this contradiction, this paradox yeah. mm -hmm. about universities. I think American universities embody this paradox in 2022 perfectly, right? Yeah. They are remarkably cosmopolitan. <laughs> they bring the world to the United States and they bring the United States to the world in the best of imaginable ways. 
And who can imagine the power of the United States government without universities? It's, it's constitutive, it's fundamental. Uh, and the US government, of course, is very uh, aware of that. That's not necessarily, necessarily a bad contradiction, but it is uh, you know, something of a tension. So that's the question I wanted to ask you or just to, uh, to, to pose to you, how you worked with that in the book, perhaps when the writing of the book or the conception of it, what your research brought uh, you know, to mind when you, uh, when you did it, and then when you wrote the book itself, how you worked through this complicated mm. thing that is a university uh, with its good and bad sides and you know, sort of two angels on the side of the university and, and the angel of cosmopolitanism and the angel of, of, uh, of power politics, really. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Michael, for those comments. I think you, you, you really did put your finger on, I think, one of the key contradic contradictions mm -hmm. um, that the university um, embodies. And, and I do think it, it is one of the key takeaways of the book, which is, and I'm glad you, 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 you sort of so, um, you know, so eloquently laid out sort of the two sides of the coin here, because I do think a lot, a lot of times we, as you said, we tend to romanticize, we scholars tend to romanticize, maybe others do as well, you know, the university as this, this kind of cosmopolitan place, and we forget it, that, that um, it's, um, also, sort of, uh, as you said, an engine sort of of the, of the nation state. And I do think that that is one of the historical lessons of, of the trajectory of the university, that the university always stood at the crossroads of, you know, on the one hand, being a conduit, as you say, for sort of our shared humanity, and on the other hand, um, sort of a very important institution for projecting national power into the world. And I do think that it goes back to the academic social contract and the relationship between state and society, Cynthia, that, that you raised, which makes it all very relevant, I think, for today, which is that if you see if you see the university only as this lofty cosmopolitan place, then you miss, I think, the very transactional sort of way that the university is embodied in the wider society. Had the university just been a place of lofty ideals and cosmopolitan sort of bliss and the exchange of knowledge, then we wouldn't be here talking about them. I mean, I think that they would be a sort of footnote to a sort of history of science that there was like these philology seminars at the University of Göttingen where they were doing really interesting biblical criticism. But the fact is that in the early 19th century, they begin to be seen as a sort of important building block to state building. And then ultimately, as, as I was saying, the sort of sine qua non of any self-respecting modern nation state. And I do think that that's part of the sort of I don't know, the, the devil's bargain here, right, is that in exchange for that patronage, that also protection, that institutional autonomy, um, as well as the importance, right, like the centrality then of universities moving to the center of the national story, like becoming relevant, um, then is this um, set of services that the university then is expected to, 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 to support. Why else um, should say the, the state of Prussia sort of foot the bill for an institution, unless it's going to help sort of improve our civil service, you know, we're going to have better, better tax collecting, you know, stronger military, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and I think that what happens is that, you know, with 1933, um, you know, Hitler cashes in on that. It takes him all of three months to co-opt an institution that was the premier institution in the world for 300 years. And I think part of that is because this arrangement that I'm calling the academic a social contract is that he doesn't change the arrangement. It just shows how malleable and how vulnerable it was, right? He basically says you can keep your institutions as long as you sort of, you know, uh, sort of show loyalty and subservience to the new, you know, Third Reich. And by the way, these other people like Jews and socialists and non-Aryans um, aren't going to be part of this project anymore because that's not how our universities will show our sort of loyalty to the to the to the nation state. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think what's what's in some ways kind of is, you know disturbing is that with the mass emigration of '33, as you say, which is a continuation rather than a beginning, by the way, of a story. Um, most people begin their stories in some ways where this one ends. Um, you know, the Americans don't object to that arrangement initially. They say, well, like, the university is apolitical, so we can't interfere in politics. It's not our business to sort of comment on this new regime, this third right regime. And, you know, up until 1936, 1937, university presidents are sending 
sort of representatives to um, important events like the 550th Jubilee of the University of Heidelberg, in effect, giving their tacit validation of this new regime's institution. And so I think that also illustrated the way that the international community is kind of implicit in the new, complicit in the new sort of shift of the academic social contract, because it's the international community is not always, you know, shared humanity and internationalism. It can also <laughs> be the conduit for resurgent nationalism, as, as we're seeing today. And, you know, um, the science of eugenics and, and, and racism could also flow along those same streams as the cosmopolitanism of, cosmopolitanism of the Weimar Republic. And I think that's where these two stories, um, the kind of state and society one, um, as well as the sort of nationalism and internationalism one sort of collide. Can I ask a follow-up mm -hmm. question to that? Which is, um, so I think this is a really fascinating, um, you know, again, I'm gonna put my, keep my sociologist hat on and, and try to ask you to, to, mm. to teach us, about, <laughs> you know, what have, what have we learned from that mm. moment and the, the moments that you're talking about right, right there for what we're seeing now? Um, both, you know, I mean, the work I've done in higher education and on the university itself, as you know, from a shared colleague that we have, um, is really on the, the national security orientations during the Cold War, mm -hmm. right? So a sort of later period of time mm -hmm. looking at how universities get used by the mm -hmm. federal government in the U.S. to kind of um, produce certain kinds of knowledge that are of use to the state um, to solve pressing problems in the world, whether that's development or, or national mm -hmm. security, et cetera. But, and I feel like, so there, you know, that's another example of universities and scholars themselves being kind of complicit in the project of the state and what the state wanted, whether that's combating communism or, um, or, um, producing certain mm -hmm. kinds of linguistic expertise, mm -hmm. you know, that we need, um, like there weren't enough Russian speakers as there mm -hmm. are now, right, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. they, right. so funding like huge amounts of Russian studies programs and all the area studies programs mm -hmm. that came. So, but then today what we're seeing, and this will be a political question too, but when you start to see kind of states turn against the university, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. at the state level, right, um, challenging tenure, Mm -hmm. unraveling professors' rights to testify um, at court, right? right, and right. Then, so without naming names of states themselves, we're just seeing like challenge after challenge after challenge of that contract and mm -hmm. that autonomy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the academy's kind of like, we're mad about it, but also not exactly resisting, right? Mm -hmm. We're all kind of doing jobs and moving forward like you don't have so mm -hmm. are, have we not learned our lesson from you know i mean or are we just not there yet i mean am i making too bad to 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 start to try to suggest that we're moving toward a 1933 is is you know is alarmist and i don't want to suggest mm -hmm. that but i also see the kinds of attacks on academic freedom the kinds of attacks on faculty autonomy um on tenure itself the unraveling of that kind of support race and red flags right yeah absolutely yeah. loyalty claims right? yeah and, and there's no doubt i mean historians love to say like this is not new this has happened over and over and over again and, and no doubt that story is here too right and the, the sort of the sort of sirens you might say that lure professors into these and scholars into these con and administrators into these contracts you know money status right um um, influence are, are, are kind of are, are appear in, in the World War I one era, they appear in the immediate post-World War II era, and you could say, you know, are, are right. sort of active in a different way today as people sort of engineer their research and their institutions sort towards like the new wave of what's considered useful, mm -hmm. right, um, for the different, um, for different communities. So I, I guess, um, you know, I guess one way to think about that, I mean, sort of, <laughs> um, is, is I, I mean, sometimes you talk about the sociologist hat. I think the intellectual historian hat in me that like, you know, tells the story of the long durée, the slow sort of hidden movements over time and is referencing, you know, the Catholic church and, and, and sort of the, the British parliament is saying that, you know, you know, you know, mass MOOCs or massive open online courses aren't gonna kill the university any more than, you know, one tenure case is, right? Mm -hmm. The university, has shown itself 
to, to, to be resilient by adapting, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in some of those cases, um, the pushback is such that, you know, the call out of the academic social co contract eventually um, makes those uh, forces back off, you know, as has been the case, I think, in a couple of the states to which you're, to which you're alluding, right? And you can say the same thing happened, you know, in the late 40s, early 50s during the McCarthyism. Um, McCarthy era, where university professors were asked to sign loyalty oats. And I had to sign one at yeah. NYU, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're still uh, up. Yeah. There. I mean, yeah. we still have to sign them at certain universities. Huh. Against it was like a, or something. Yeah, so it was like, literally was something like against communism. Uh -huh. Like I agree to it was, right. it was a long right. and right. I, you know, and I asked like what happens if I don't sign this? They're like, oh, it's a you have to sign you it. Have to sign right. it. Right. You have to sign it. You have to sign it. Okay, like my first academic right. job. Right. I signed it. Right. But I was felt yeah. really like that was a definitely a legacy of something else. They're still out there. The number right. of universities still have them. Yeah. So I think that's you know, one might say, well, that's a constitutive of this academic right. social contract, right? Yeah. You can have your autonomy, you know, and, and you can do your research, you know, your basic research, your knowledge for its own sake, you know, yeah. um, what is it sort of <laughs> study your anthropology or your women's studies or whatever, whatever yeah. field is currently being sort of um, maligned right now sort of in the cup in the public discourse in exchange for which we, ex we sort of expect your tacit or sometimes explicit your support, right? And I think that 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 has a range what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, perhaps oaths that kind of exist in one form or another, yeah. contracts that exist in one constitution, residual. Something. Like they're yes. they're residual, I think, of that sort of original yeah. contract. Now, when enough people push back, right? It's sort of a classic sort of like loyalty um, exit mm -hmm. sort of strategy kind of problem, right? Do you stay in the institution and you fight it or do you leave the institution and go found a new one? And I think that's what we see kind of over time, right? Is as academic contracts sort of dissolve, like new ones sort of rush, new ones rush in right. to take their place. And I think that's part of how you get institutional innovation yeah. is in sort of the pushing back against those contracts, which, which no longer seem to represent their constituents. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when you talked about students in the beginning, you know, and sort of these promises of sort of self-transformation um, for individuals, you know, that's an, yet another purpose of the university because academic social contracts aren't usually just with two partners. Increasingly, especially after the post-World War II period, there was many more partners, right? The constituents kind of expand even greatly. Um, now you have other civic kind of institutions and actors from nonprofits to private donors to the students who are now paying more and more. So shouldering, you know, whose families are now shouldering more and more of the, of the, of the financial burden of these institutions, all of which expect their needs to be factored in to that arrangement. And sometimes when it becomes untenable, again, it breaks down and new institutions sort of are founded that will claim, you know, will find different configurations of partners um, that will that will seem more sort of relevant in the current kind of moment. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I want to bring a few different things that you've family together. And I think everyone can sort of answer this, uh, everyone of the three of you. <laughs> I'm sure you all have wonderful input as well. Um, you mentioned earlier on that you're hoping that allies and rivals can persuade the reader of a few salient points. Could you outline what some of those like most most important points of which you're trying to, to persuade the reader? Yeah, that's a great, great um, question. Um, I think so it often depends what audience I'm talking to, which points I think I, <laughs> I emphasize. Um, I think first I mentioned the point that, you know, the big kind of picture point is that I, is that, is I want to convince people that history sort of matters, right? Especially institutional history and especially of institutions that we take to be self-evident, right? Um, institutions that we assume have always been there. Right. And so we can't challenge them. And perhaps we've even forgotten what their origins are. And so, you know, I think sometimes, you know, cultures can be so sort of future oriented, um, you know, for instance, like Silicon Valley, where my <laughs> home institution is 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 based. Um, that there's kind of we're so focused on tomorrow that we think the past doesn't matter. And I and I and I'd like to show through this institutional history sort of the that there is um, a space, 
uh, a bit that between kind of the constraints on what we can um, found um, and the autonomy that we have to do anything. And in that space is where kind of you can make change, right? And which is why I said that it depends who I'm talking to, right? Because I think that if I'm talking to kind of, you know, institutional reformers or entrepreneur types, you know, who think, ah, history that has nothing to do with me, then I want to sort of emphasize the point that, you know, like sort of actually institutional history, institutional memory, path dependency, like all of this matters and, 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 and will create the conditions of possibility for your, for your kind of new startup institution. But I think if I'm talking to, you know, administrators or institutional leaders or education leaders, I think in some ways the message is sort of, is sort of the opposite, which is to say that, you know, institutions don't have a force of their own that sort of like marches them through history. We are not passive cogs in the wheel of this institutional cycle. Um, even if I sometimes seem like I'm a Hegelian sort of in this in this story, but 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 rather, I think the stars of this story are the individuals with you know who pull the levers of change. Without which, these institutions wouldn't have been founded. You don't have a Johns Hopkins without Daniel Coit Gilman, right? Um, you know much like you probably don't have an ASU today without Michael Crow, right? Like you can see this, I think, in the, in the sort of present day, the way that charismatic sort of individuals with visions and an ability to cross between different sort of constituents can forge compromises to create institutions that will sort of stand the test of time. And so I, I think that the message has to be both and, right? Um, that institutions matter and sort of have to be respected and we have tremendous agency as well to sort of, to change them. Excellently put. Um, and so that, that leads me into something that I think Michael and Cynthia, you can, you can add to, um, you're talking about institutions historically and sociologically and societally. And earlier you spoke a little bit about the, uh, what was it, the state and society link and bridge. Mm -hmm. And I wonder as each of you were reading Allies and Rivals, did, did some points relate to that sort of jump out to you, especially relevant to your, your personal mm -hmm. backgrounds and your, your um, area of work? Mm -hmm. I know you all have a lot of notes, so if you wanna pull from those, mm -hmm. that would okay. be wonderful. When you were talking about this earlier, about the fluidity between sort of the civil servants and the, and the scholars. That's true. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's a point that strikes me maybe a little bit more in the present than in the material that uh, is, is directly in the pages of your, uh, of, of your book. But, you know, Germany and the U.S., as a very general point, they're so similar as countries in so many ways. You can mm -hmm. always find these parallels. And yet the, the closer you look, when you sort of peer under those similarities, you <laughs> see these uh, acute differences. So it's so interesting that the U.S. you know sort of took its university system, research university system from from Germany because it applies it to, to government in so many different mm -hmm. ways from from what you have in 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 Germany. So Germany, mm -hmm. when you think of of, of government, is a classic civil service mm -hmm. country uh, that you go to the foreign ministry and you spend your career there, mm -hmm. uh, or you you know mm -hmm. sort of go and work in the party of of the Green Party and you mm -hmm. spend your whole career doing that. Mm -hmm. and you're sort of a a creature of the uh, of the Green Party, whereas the U.S. really has this revolving door, mm -hmm. and uh, it puts, you know, sort of academic knowledge and academics to a very different use. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just think of like the Department of State that right. uh, how many academics have cycled in and out of that uh, mm -hmm. uh, of that uh, of that uh, of that building, uh, and it goes in both directions. They go into the building from academia, and they come out of the building and go into uh, mm -hmm. and go into academia. And on the one hand, in the U.S. What that leads to, I think, relative to Germany, is a little bit more intellectual freshness. Like it is possible mm -hmm. to bring a new idea in, and because you're a little bit less the product of a bureaucracy, uh, there's mm -hmm. something vibrant about that and good, mm -hmm. but it also means that the corruption of knowledge in the US is much more advanced because the government's on balance. I, mean, I worked in the US government for two years and have lots of admiration and respect for what it does, uh, but it's, it instrumentalizes knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not really interested in knowledge as such. Mm -hmm. Why would it be, right? It's a government mm -hmm. to accomplish certain things. And, mm -hmm. you know, knowledge is a tool in the accomplishment of those, of those things. But that mm -hmm. means that professors and universities right. can become those instruments yeah. mm -hmm. uh, as well. Look, we have this professor who sort of came in or this academic who came in and that shows that it's an enterprise of some 
uh, mm. dignity and bearing. So I think the U.S. corrupts knowledge more than Germany mm. does, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's that's the downside. That's the sort of the, the price that you pay for uh, the price that you pay for the revolving door. But I'm not sure if that's a dynamic that I directly saw mm -hmm. in the book itself. I'm not I'm not sure exactly. I mean, it's, it's seen more a focus on patterns of, of, of ideas and patterns of knowledge and the sort of mapping of one institution mm -hmm. from Germany onto the uh, onto the American scene. So maybe that development is something that happens later. I did want to bring up one further point, maybe in the form of a question for you, Emily, about something like the Fulbright mm -hmm. program, which of course happens out of, out of the chronological parameters of your book. But there you have, again, in terms of, you know, sort of, it's not quite corruption, but it's, it's instrumentalization. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to bring academics and students to your country so that they get sold on the American way of life. And it really works. It's one of the best ways of, uh, of doing it, part because people are free to hate the country when they come and they can go back and badmouth it. Right? Sayyid Qutub is a Fulbright mm -hmm. scholar and goes back and, and, and contributes to sort of extremist views in, mm -hmm. in Egypt. That's a possibility. It's not forbidden by the Fulbright uh, Foundation, but on balance, people, I think, do leave mm -hmm. with a kind of positive image of the U.S. and they see often the best side of it, which is sort of the academic the academic side. So I'm curious about where something like that might fit in the parameters of your argument. You're taking universities from a government's vantage point, you're giving people access to them mm -hmm. from abroad, but the whole goal is to create a kind of pro-Americanism uh, out there. And I think the Germans do something very similar with mm -hmm. the Google Foundation, right? Mm -hmm. it's, there are no strings attached. It's not like you have to like Germany. If you do, but most yeah. of us, I'm a product of that. I left, I really like Germany. I you know, right. speak well of the country. Maybe I've been co-opted by, right. by the Humboldt Foundation. But how do these things work in, 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 in the scheme of your argument? These sort of uh, foundations that are there to bring students in and hopefully they'll sort of go out modestly as servants of the foreign policy of the country that brings them in. Well, I, I think that the sort of roots of the exchange, of, of the student exchange um, as a sort of framework are, are in my story, even if the Fulbright um, you know, and, and Humboldt's kind of come later. And what we see is something very similar to the contradiction that you laid out so beautifully earlier, right? Which is like, why do the Prussians care if the Americans are no longer going to Göttingen? Like, why are there dozens and dozens of reports in the Prussian archives from like 1900, 1901, 1902, saying, you know, charting the declining number of Americans um, who are at these, these different um, um, universities. And I, I spent a bunch of time sort of thinking about this and wondering, it's not like they're, it's not that, that, that they're paying sort of tuition, right? It's not like when we talk about, say, state institutions that are, you know, courting, say, Chinese students because they pay full price and, you know, there's critiques that they're sort of subsidizing, you know, subsidizing their institution and so they have ulterior motives. Like, it's, not, it's clearly not about that in, in 1900, um, you know, in, in Göttingen. So it, it seems to me like it's something about something more elusive, right? It's about, like I said, they call it sort of Welt, und Deutsche Wissenschaft, like the, repu the worldwide reputation of German academic research. Like they're constantly using words like this, right? It's about, it's about sort of prestige, honor, status, things that are, that are sort of, that you kind of give yourself that require, require this framework of mutual validation. And so what it comes down to is that these German universities, even under Hitler, require these students. They require these professors in order to give them that validation that anoints them as the center of you know, you know, the global knowledge center of the world. It's what makes Göttingen, you know, the place where you have to spend time before you go on to the next place or 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 Berlin or um um you know ultimately Baltimore as as Gilman works hard um to, to make it such. And so I think therein lies the kind of you know the kind of contradiction. Um, and this this was debated um sort of hot at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, in Berlin, there were some professors that say we shouldn't let the, the Americans come in because they're stealing our trade secrets and they're going back and they're making better technology. And didn't you see what they were showing, you know, in 1893 in Chicago and, you know, 1904 in St. Louis? Like, did you see those, you know, did you see those new like light bulbs and engines and, you know, machines? And, you know, they're going to, they're going to, we, we should not be letting them into our labs. 
right, and our universities. But the fact is that they had to, right? If they wanted to remain the premier seats of knowledge, then they had to because that's the irony of it, right? Like, you, 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 you know, to play by the rules of the game, you have to, you have to, you have to be open to these exchanges because, as I show, right, it's only through the free exchange of knowledge that you get that innovation, and it's only through that exchange that you get that mutual validation that supports your center as a global place, right? And if you cut yourself off from the world and you have sort of protectionist intellectual policies, right? You're neither gonna have innovation, right? Nor are you gonna be any more um, a sort of place on the map, right? Um, and yet by opening yourself up to your institutional rivals, you also like leave yourself open to potential sort of takeover and that, you know, you know, Palo Alto or, um, you know, may not always be the, the global center of knowledge. And I think that's the other kind of salient point, I think, of the book is like really trying to kind of sort of get getting sort of readers to sort of see that sort of America wasn't always sort of didn't always have the best universities in the world. And it might not, probably not, won't not have the best universities in the world. That's just not the way that the cycles of sort of global centers go, which like nation states, you know, rise and fall. And the students are sort of pawns in this sort of arrangement, I think, and they're important ones. I mean, it's just a footnote yeah. to the story that you're telling, but uh, it's, it's, it is within the chronology of the book, this particular program, but the Rhodes Scholarship accomplishes right. all this with such incredible yeah. precision yeah. and success. You just think like right now, right, the National Security Advisor is the Rhodes Scholar, the Deputy National Security is for Rhodes Scholar. What a, right. what a phenomenal investment on the part of the, of right. the British government, but the Rhodes Foundation, which is, of course, an explicitly imperial project was right. founded, right? It's to link the Anglo-American worlds, the English-speaking peoples in a kind of joint imperial project. But mm -hmm. time at a university is the thing that does that. Right. But of course, the Brits have a huge advantage over Germany, which is that you don't have to learn German to go and <laughs> right. study there. So it's much easier. The Germans have that built-in disadvantage in terms of getting Americans over that the linguistic barrier is mm -hmm. often pretty extreme for you know, a country that doesn't like to learn foreign languages. <laughs> But I mean, it goes back to what you were saying before, but like, you know, the government's only interested in useful knowledge, instrumentalizing knowledge. Of course it is. It's a government. I, I guess I feel like, you know, what I sort of spiritedly refute is the idea, though, that institutions sort of were ever remote from the world, sort of doing sort of knowledge for its own sake exclusively and not in any arrangement with society, allowing them to sort of, you know, pursue also um, useless knowledge, right? <laughs> um, right, as, as Abraham Flexner once called it, um, um, or justifying their useful, your, their useless knowledge um, on the basis of its eventual use, usefulness, right, um, for the state. Um, because it shouldn't be so surprising that those things kind of happen because they're in the self-interest of one person and, and are viewed as cosmopolitan and lofty and sort of, you know, um, universalist in, a, in another. Mm -hmm. It's why they happen because they appeal to all these entities, and that's what pushes this institution sort of forward. And occasionally, you see the friction, um, and that's when you know you start to get sort of anxiety about academic freedom and sort mm -hmm. of um, you know um, and and other I think more serious issues in other places around around the world. Yeah, I mean, the thing I was thinking, oh, what, this is going to be like a super sad way to end. <laughs> Suitable for our moment. Yeah, so, you know, again, back to the, you know, back to the contemporaries, that's just where my head is, but, you know, the story of this, this incredible narrative of this um, triumphant error, mm -hmm. really, of knowledge production and of universities in both countries culminating maybe, or maybe not culminating, but where we are in this current moment now with, uh, I think the latest statistics are something like only 25% of college courses mm -hmm. are taught by tenured faculty mm -hmm, or by tenured mm -hmm. track faculty even, right? So this mm -hmm. massive shift mm -hmm. to um, contingent labor and overburdened, you know, people with higher course loads who don't get to do yeah. the research or who are, you know, so this, the the model, even in the 20 years I've been in the academy, like I have really seriously advised students differently now than I mm -hmm. did when I started about going into grad mm -hmm. school, what are you going to go to a, to get a PhD program? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to get a PhD, really carefully consider it in terms of the opportunity costs mm -hmm. and where you go, even though it's worked out really well, you know, for me and my generation and not all of us, of course, mm -hmm. it's tough, mm -hmm. but 
but um, there are almost no jobs. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the labor market has collapsed for mm -hmm. so many. And, you know, that is not a temp, I don't think that that's a temporary dip. Mm -hmm. You know, it does mm -hmm. feel like a moment of real collapse of mm -hmm. the kind of academy that I left mm -hmm. as a grad student um, and started out in, in the academy as a professor. So I wonder, is that too pessimistic an outlook in the grand arc of things? Can I, can I jump yeah. in for a second and, yeah. and play uh, the optimistic devil's advocate? Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, not, not in the terms that you're describing, which I think are, you know, it's absolutely persuasive and true what you say about the labor conditions and shifting finances. And it's really the crisis, I would say, of the humanities. I don't think the natural That's sciences true. are in the same kind of same kind of crisis mm -hmm. and the social sciences are probably That's somewhere true. somewhere in between. But uh, I mean, what great beacons of cosmopolitanism American universities are and German universities are, right? It's just extraordinary. What, I mean, it's a terrible thing that the pandemic has done to it. And in the Trump administration, we did have problems with visas and mm -hmm. fewer of our students wanted to study at US universities. I don't know if we've rebounded from that because the pandemic you know, has done its damage, but be that as it may, uh, just you know, sort of think in the city of Washington, DC, what it brings to the city the students who come from all different countries, the languages that are studied, the ways in which area studies programs and other programs are champions of the film and the mm -hmm. art and the uh, and the culture of, of really the whole world in, in, in so many respects. And what a gift that is. And that's one of the gifts that comes out of the period mm -hmm. that you describe. And I would say German universities are very similar. Although indeed, when you look at the faculty, they don't incorporate people from Turkish backgrounds, minority backgrounds, nearly as well as they should. And that you know, I wouldn't want to you know, be too Pollyannish in, in terms of this celebratory mode, but still in terms of the work that they do, mm -hmm. the contributions that they make, they are splendidly cosmopolitan. So mm -hmm. there it is. There's that, you know, that yeah. other, you know, that other strain. And it's very much with us. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's if we didn't have these, can you imagine the vacancy yeah. that would be there in the national life of the United States or the national life of Germany, the vacancy that would be there in terms yeah. of exactly this mm -hmm. place of cosmopolitan change. So they're not utopian by any means, right. but not dystopian either, I would say, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair. That's a good kind of... Mm -hmm. you know, we want to try to end up Exactly. Well, <laughs> less sad. And I appreciate the yin too. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. also nice to be optimistic also that German and, and American universities now co cooperate tremendously, right? There's huge for every summer in Germany doing mm -hmm. uh, stuff over there and there are tons of Germans who do the same uh, over uh, over here, and it's so interesting. I don't know if this is validation or a deviation from your argument, Emily, but look at the, the cooperation between Germany and the US. Probably the most important foreign policy partner of the US, whether it's sanctioning Russia mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. climate change or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of European integration. I mean, there's just so many ways in which the German government is a fabulous partner and vice versa for for Germany, so what a good moment we live in, right? Yeah. <laughs> so think of 1933, yeah. right? It's, 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 it's it took a, a lot to spin our current moment towards optimism, but I really appreciate it. Yeah. 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 How brightly yeah. the star shines. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think we have some time for questions from the mm -hmm. audience, if you have some. Oh, good. When? Uh, I wanted to ask uh, who and what did Mr. Du Bois? study and do and why was he in Germany? That's a, that's a great, great question. Um, so um, Du Bois um, was interested in sociology, actually, <laughs> and he was interested in studying with these new historians who were using new methods um, to uh, study how it was that huge, huge populations and societies were, were sort of transforming from sort of older societies where people worked um, um, on the farms or maybe had slaves to being modern societies um, where people were working in cities and 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 were sort of in, in, in employed and and what the consequences of that would be for American cities and so he came back and he used those methods to do a big study for example on um, African Americans in in Philadelphia to think about how it would be that um, he would sort of raise the African American population um, out of um, poverty, emancipate them culturally, intellectually, and sort of um, sort of integrate them into um, to be leaders of American society. Um, and he was infatuated with Bismarck um, and um, sort of. 
you know, he, he wrote his, his thesis um, at, at Fisk, which is a, 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 a historically black university on Bismarck, and maybe even sort of thought himself uh, as a Bismarck sort of figure who would unite sort of lots of peoples from around um, various places into being a stronger um, unified uh, people. Great question. Good answer. Any others? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, you know, you, you all talked about the kind of the the, the trend, uh, transactional relationship um, that universities have, have had more and more these days, especially. And I agree with Cynthia. I'm a little bit of a pessimist in that sense. <laughs> um, where, duly noted, <laughs> especially for individuals from my generation, right? There's a breakdown of the formality and the relationship, especially with regard to research that we see um in in relation to, to to society and kind of how information is produced so how do you all see that relationship transforming moving forward um and you know um to especially again from individuals from my generation right there's even kind of the argument that you don't even go to university you don't need it right it's mm. it is it is just selling you you know, a life on campus, it's just to find yourself, it's not to find, you know, um, you know, knowledge and a legitimate profession. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's a two pronged question. A, where yeah. do you see the relationship with research yeah. moving forward in the future? Um, and, you know, are we seeing kind of uh, a really transformational shift in um, how higher education is used by society, especially in America moving forward. Yeah. Okay, back to the downer side of <laughs> things. You've got me there. I mean, I think we are in a uniquely bad moment, um, but it's interesting, and I'll, and I'll tell you why, because I think the university is kind of being criticized, as you imply, from both the right, as it were, and the left. So, you know, in, in North Carolina, for example, where I taught for, for um, nearly a, a decade, you would often hear sort of um, sort of comments from, in particular, like Republican legislators say, saying, you know, the university isn't teaching, you know, students, you know, usable, marketable skills, right? It's sort of become removed from sort of, you know, the needs of societies. We need to be teaching, you know, students um, based on what the needs are of the market, right? Um, sort of it, it's sort of instrumentalization kind of in a different uh, way. And, and as they're pointing, pointing to sort of labor statistics to sort of, you um, um, to promote this. But we also hear increasingly um, over the last five, maybe 10 years, sort of this very, very fierce critique from the, from the left, which is that um, the, the university, um, you know, is, isn't open um, to, to um, everyone, right? And it's not making good on its sort of promises, its lofty promises of, you know, of, of sort of anyone can have a shot at this institution and use it as, as a way as a way into like the, the, the middle class, right? Um, and that the institutions have become so selective, we can't even speak about admissions with any deal of sincerity because, um, you know, we're, um, we're not actually sort of um, you know, we're, we're, we're not serving most young people in this country. And of course, you know, student debt is enormous and, you know, outpaced, I think most every other kind of debt, um, credit card debt and in the la others in the, in the last, in the, in the last years. And then we've got this other kind of neither left nor right, I don't know, <laughs> sort of critique that we, who needs it anyway, as you say, right? Because, you know, I could just go to coding boot camp, or I'll just like do my startup and, you know, the university isn't going to help me with that sort of the credential has proved itself to be no longer sort of um, um, significant. And I think I said it's uniquely bad because it's being kind of sieged by all sides, you could say. I mean, in some cases, like left and right, I mean, left and right don't even really make sense most of the time, I think, in this kind of conversation in which you have these like multi-pronged critiques but what it means from my perspective is that the university is doing a really, really bad job sort of as an institution in conveying to the public what it does do for it, right? It's not actually um, showing what the public good is that it's offering in this kind of academic social contract agreement. 
for example, you know, the, the, the way it's contributing to its cities and making them more cosmopolitan, you know, the, the economic development that it's doing for other regions, you know, in this country that are actively using universities to try to, you know, sort of re-energize their, their cities, right? Um, the other kind of R&D research that's being done that's, you know, having transformative, um, you know, effects in, in, in healthcare. I mean, the, the, the race to find a vaccine was sort of an interesting kind of coda to the story and goes back to sort of your points about Turkish Germans mm -hmm. and science and internationalism and universities and so forth. So, um, but the university is not doing a great job in sort of make, in, in, in sort of making that story, I think, known. And it also needs to be doing more, right, in those in those categories. There's no doubt. And I think, you know, I think the hope is that 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 we can transform the conversation to thinking more about sort of what the university is giving, sort of for the public good in exchange for its sort of status as this autonomous, you know, tax exempt <laughs> um, sort of unique institution that's neither private nor public. Even the private ones and public ones are not exactly either private or public, but are quasi civic institutions between state and society, right? Um, and so I think that's what the new chapter might be. If, if I could yeah. jump in there. I mean, I think if the left and right are criticizing American universities, it's probably a good sign uh, <laughs> because it must be, they must be doing something right. If, if it were the only one side of the political spectrum, I would be more worried about, uh, about that. And I personally have no objection to universities being transactional in terms of vocational training and putting mm -hmm. people into the economy. I mean, I think that that's a very reasonable function for a university, but your question is, is spot on. Uh, the university doesn't just have to have a, a purpose, a sort of technical purpose. It has to have an alma mater, right? It has to have a soul. And universities begin as religious institutions. Of course, you need a professor from Catholic University to come <laughs> you know, make this point to this audience, right? But they come from monasteries yeah. and they come uh, in the medieval period as, as religious institutions. And that dominates universities for centuries. And then the Humboldtian University is much more defined by the humanities. And of course, if you ask about Du Bois, I mean, what Du Bois thought about the university is literature, philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, the arts. I sit with Shakespeare, he means it's not. And you know, these sort mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. very uh, dramatic appeals Du Bois made to the humanities. That's run its course. I would love to see the humanities as the soul of the American university, but it's just not true anymore. It's not really what undergraduates want to study. And, you know, humanities are not, in my view, in such a great shape in terms of you know, just not that exciting. It, it, uh, in some sense, so it's got to be something else. We have to find a new soul. It can't just be the transactional, uh, the transactional mm -hmm. relationship. It has to be much more than that. But I think none of us can really say at the moment what that much more mm -hmm. is. We're not going to go back to religion. I mean, okay, Catholic University can do it because it's a, it, it's a religious school, but not, you know, most universities. That's not what people want, nor nor, nor should they. Uh, and the humanities can't do it anymore. So I don't know what can. The sports can't really do it either, right? I mean, it's nice to have a good sports mm -hmm. team, but that's not you know, educational enough to really be the soul of the university. So what would it be now? I don't, and tech, I don't know, can't, well, tech, can't do it either. Places, you know? I mean, there may be places where the human, you know, so I'm, I'm also thinking of, this is, this is a point that somebody else made in a panel that I was on virtually a couple of months ago, but, you know, when, when COVID hit, when the pandemic started, one of the things that Germany did that I think was really different from almost any other country was convened not just the epidemiologists, but they convened a panel nationally of humanists, mm -hmm. of um, philosophers and poets mm -hmm. and artists and, um, you know, people from the humanities who would help the country think about what the response should be for the humanity of people, right? Beautiful. Knowing that this pandemic was about to hit and was hitting and that it would have an impact on, on our own humanity, right? And not just our physiology right. and our right. physical well-being, but also the rest of us. And but it, part of what made that possible, I think, in Germany, I mean, there are a lot of things that made that possible in Germany and inconceivable here mm -hmm. in its own way, the way we think about the humanities. But because we because we charge for university in a different way, we think about knowledge in this set and we've come to think about it in a much more transactional way mm -hmm. I think and that has helped I think undermine the humanities in a way mm -hmm. so maybe it's not that the mm -hmm. humanities themselves can't do it mm -hmm. but it can't be done in a system where mm -hmm. knowledge itself right. either has to be immediately transactional for the state's needs mm -hmm. the short term especially mm -hmm. right that's the way that mm -hmm. I mean I mean I was funded for grad school in part to study Russian um, in the end of the cold, you know, right at the end of the cold war. And then all that money evaporated, right? That mm -hmm. title eight, title six money all left 
and you know pivoted to Arabic support um, mm-hmm. for 20 years. And now it's back. Now they're like, where are all the Russian speakers, right? They're all retired, right? Mm-hmm. So right, these, these long-term, we don't really make long-term transactional investments right. in knowledge right. in this country. We make really short-term, like, right. you know, we need this right now and get it. So in the humanities, there's something different. So maybe, you know, maybe that's where public-private partnerships come in, mm-hmm. is that it's the humanities can be restored, but with donor support that is different. And that is another thing that's really different. I mean, right. our own university is on its capital campaign and has raised 300 million of its $500 million in the last six months, like an insane amount of money, mm-hmm. it seems, right? It's nothing compared to what Stanford raises, but just, you know, that the, you know, donors can step up and be mobilized mm-hmm. to, to do stuff like that if motivated by leaders to do so, I think. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I'm not sure that this country as a state, you know, will ever invest in the humanities to, you know, even though we need it. <laughs> and I say that as a social scientist. <laughs> well, what a note to end on, but thank you all so much for, for joining us this evening. This has been actually riveting to um <laughs> to listen to and i'm very excited that we, we were able to have you here tonight so thank you so much thank you thank you thank you yes thank you it's really interesting conversation it really has been yeah, yeah. You're inviting us to be a part of it. yeah it here. yeah thank you for your questions